All right, we are live. Let's see if I got the camera on. Looking okay, I guess. Um, so, uh, I'm Ben Brooks, as you probably know, and uh, we're live today. We're going to talk our weekly segment of Pilot Minute Coaching, follow-up to the weekly free executive coaching we do. You can go to www.pilot.coach, C-O-A-C-H, slash minute, and sign up for Pilot Minute Coaching. It's free. Every week you get advice from me, custom advice, and then we have a follow-up session to discuss the topic of kind of the day. So, um, hey, Cesar. Um, so the thing that we want to talk about today is that you're more qualified than you think. So I'm going to repeat that again. Hey, Benjamin, um, is, you know, when I say you're more qualified than you think, there's this weird inferior, inferiority complex that a lot of people have when I talk to them about their careers and say, oh, I don't know, maybe this person would talk to me, maybe. Like, you have to be a lot more bold and resolute and certain about you and your abilities and your strengths and not be like, oh, this big company, oh my God, you know, like, like it's a company full of people who are just like you and just like me that went to schools like us that, you know, have experiences like us. And so you may be trying to crack into a new industry or, you know, go to a, you know, more prestigious brand or do something cooler. Great. But still, you got to bring your game, right? Don't, you don't want to be like desperate, you know? Hey, Cesar. Um, you don't want to be desperate. You want to think about like all that you're bringing to the table. And frankly, you know, in companies, as they get bigger and bigger, there's like a pyramid, right, that gets built, you know, in the hierarchy, in the org chart. And then the roles get smaller and smaller, and they get really narrow, and they say, okay, like, Ben does this, right? Well, the thing is, is that, like, I'm a whole person. I've got stuff I do in the community, and socially, and enrichment, and with friends. Hey, Diego. And uh, there's all these cool things that I do, right? But, like, my job, it can be very, hey, Amy, can be very narrow. And so I bring a lot more to the table than maybe my job gives me credit for or my title gives me credit for. So what I want to do is I want to think about myself, like, bringing a lot more there. A story I remember, someone I know who is um, in academic ad admissions, they were, like, a, you know, senior manager at a college and university to recruit students for undergrad, wanted to get out of that, and they wanted to do something somewhat similar but out of academia, and they said, like, and I said, well, why don't you be a, a recruiter, a campus recruiter for a company, like a bank or a consulting firm? You know campuses. You know young people. You know how to recruit. That You know, you have all these connections. It seems like an obvious thing. And he, he was like, oh, my God, I, like, I don't have an MBA. And da, 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 da. Now, mind you, he had, like, two master's degrees already or something, which, you know, anyone that knows good recruiters don't, knows they don't require, like, a graduate degree. It requires really good people skills and hustle and psychology, like those sort of things, which a lot of those you can't really learn in school. So education can have us feel like we're inferior. I mean, I know a lot of people that don't have a college degree. Now, some of the most successful people I know in business didn't graduate college, maybe even didn't even go to college. But they won't apply for jobs because it'll say, full bachelor's four-year deg degree required. Well, you know, look, it's more like that's a nice to have, and sure, that's great, but you know, if you're 38 years old, like, does it matter what you did when you were 18? You are probably drunk somewhere in like Indiana, whatever. Like, I don't know if that matters. Um, I had a great experience at college. I learned a ton. I got great grades. I studied abroad. I'm not against education, but it's one of those things that what have you done from 18 to 38? Because you may have done a whole lot more compelling things than a four-year degree somewhere, you know, getting average grades. Um, my friend that was the, the, the admissions thing, like, you don't need that MBA to go be a recruiter for a company, you know, those sort of things. So, um, you know, no, it's a great comment from Russ. Uh, don't feel guilty for not knowing something. Don't let the guilt hold you back. Totally. There's a shitload of things that I don't know, but I don't let that get in the way of me being curious or learning. If I only worked on what I knew, I would have only worked on the things that, I don't know, like somehow I had figured out over time. Um, you know, I got into HR, I didn't know about HR, but I got really curious. What did I do? Like, I would be on webinars and I'd call into these like random internet radio shows about HR and I'd go to conferences and I'd read books. Hey, Luis. Um, and I do all these things to be curious. I got mentors and, you know, I was just so hungry. Hey, Andrew. And I would just like be, you know, I'd want to know more so I could get better. And I became more qualified over time because I was curious and I let myself do that. You know, it's like the catch 22 of like a salesperson will say, hey, Rachel, it'll be like a salesperson will say 10 years of demonstrated sales experience exceeding quota. Well, great. Like, but what are you, how do you get 10 years of experience if no one will hire a salesperson without 10 years of experience? It just doesn't make any sense. So someone's going to have to take a bet on you. 
and you're going to likely sell them through your relationships and your network, not applying online, right? Like applying online, they're going to look at your resume and say, uh, maybe not qualified per this job description, which we'll get to job descriptions in a second and why they kind of suck. Resumes totally suck as well. I hope at some point we'll look at some this historical archive of this YouTube or this Facebook Live video and go, oh my God, remember when Ben was talking about resumes and job descriptions? How antiquated. You know, we'll think of it like the printing press or the Pony Express or like old shit like that. So... When you think about, you know, applying, that's not a great way. It's better to, like, have someone know you and want to take a bet on you. Now, they're not going to give you the job just because they know you. They're going to get you the interview. And then you can sell yourself and you can bring your whole self to the, the table. It may be that you're a graphic designer, right? And the, part of the role is business development, but you never did that in your other graphic design jobs. But then when you say, oh, but, you know, I'm on the board of this charity and I help raise $50,000 for annual benefit... It's like, oh, well, that's interesting. I guess you can ask for money and you can put proposals together and you can persuade and follow up. You have the sales skills just from a different domain. Hey, Lillian. Um, so that's one of the things to think about in terms of being more qualified than you think, that, that your qualifications could come from a community group. It could come from a sports league or your faith or something you do in your family. You may be from a, like a Greek family of like 15 siblings and corralling them all for the annual like family thing in you know North Carolina or something like that may be like a great demonstration of leadership of people that really sometimes don't want to listen to you what a great story be so engaging if someone came to an interview and told me that I'd be like wow this is a person they can hurt cats like that sounds amazing and that's exactly what we need here now job descriptions when you think about job descriptions and I will say actually we just put the pilot thing below there so minute coaching we do every week it's free it takes just a minute and you get custom advice from me and accountability this week's session was about being more qualified than you think, so you want to go watch that video. It takes one minute. Go to pilot.coach slash minute. Super easy. And then you get better at your career a minute at a time every week. It's like super rad. So do it. Check it out. So the thing when you think about job descriptions is when they're written, here's the secret. As someone who was like in HR, I was a senior vice president of HR. I know how this works. They're in some little database maybe, and they just pull the job description for like a graphic designer or... The HR person will like kind of type something up and cut and paste something from their last company and then the manager looks at it for a few and, then, and they go, yeah, look, looks good, give me some resumes, right? They just want to see some resumes. Or the manager will draft it and they don't know how to draft a job description and they'll put some boilerplate thing and they'll put, you know, a master's degree required and they don't mean that and they actually mean that maybe it'd be nice or they think it'd be nice but they don't, they haven't, they don't, they're not thoughtful, they're not conscious about what they even want. You just have to have some stuff there. So the, and the, the recruiter often wants more qualifications on there, so it's easier to sort people out. And so they put that up there, and then we look at it and we think, not me, I, uh, you bite your nails, like I can't apply for that job, I'm not qualified. Well, like that's just like, no. Like that'd be like me, you know, asking me who my ideal like soulmate and like lover is going to be in life, you know. I would have like a long list of things, right? Now, would I marry someone that didn't have all those things? Absolutely. You know, that that's the sort of thing that, you know, it's, it's, you have your desires as a company and you have desires as a hiring manager, but you're willing to take something different or different combination, in particular, if you can cast yourself as a kind of unique person with a unique set of skills. So I want you to have a lot more confidence that you're better than you might think you look on paper, um, that you should go for things. I mean, people oftentimes, if you're just like, I really want this and I'm willing to learn and I'm hungry and I am open, hey, Nathan. Um, they're going to say like, great, you know, hey Glenn, they're going to say, great, we'll give you a shot. You know, it's so often I've interviewed a gazillion people in my life. People show up at the interview and you think like the only reason they're there is because they didn't die the night before. It's like, oh my God, like where is your energy here? Where is your excitement? Where's your professionalism? They come in, they're sloppy. They don't care. They're like, whatever. Like, why do you want this job? I need a job. Like, that's like not a great answer when you're interviewing for, you know, a VP job to work for me. Like, that's not a great answer. So coming in with just a little bit of excitement just to say like, hey, I'm hungry, you know, like you want me to know salesforce.com? Never have used it. But you know what? I've been reading up on their blog. I went to their virtual conference. I'm going to get trained in it. Like I'm going to know it. In fact, how'd you learn it? Oh, you learned it on the job? Great. Maybe I can too. Can we get started on that now? Like, like those areas, just lean into the fact that you don't have that experience, but have a plan to get the experience. Have a plan. Hey, Pedro, have a plan to like get better. Hey, Mike. Uh, and think about just all of the things you can do to say, okay, like I'll figure that out. You know, like when I, I mean, look, most jobs that I've got hired for in my life, I was not qualified for on paper. It wasn't like I had 10 years of experience in them, but I was curious in the topic and, and, you know, and I had maybe some school or education or something like that, but like 
frankly, hey, Stephanie, but frankly, like I just convinced them that I was willing to learn and I was a hard worker and I was open and coachable. And that was that. And I figured it out. Management consulting, Lean Six Sigma, and contracts, and HR, I don't know any of these things. Um, but it was on me to be responsible, to be curious, to go out in the world and to learn them. A little coffee so I keep my energy up. So the thing is, like, education. You know, I'm pro-education. My family's involved in the education business. Like, I'm all about it. But, like, it doesn't necessarily make you qualified. Like, I meet some people with a master's degree or something. And, like, what that means is they have a master's degree. It doesn't mean they're qualified to do a job. It means that they learned a certain amount of knowledge and a fairly old model of learning knowledge. Uh, and they, that may make them qualified. That may not make them qualified. You know, like, if someone came to me with an MBA and they wanted to be a salesperson, I'd kind of go, hmm, I'd rather see them go to, like, a Zig Ziglar training or something like that or learn, you know, read the Little Red Book of Selling or do something like that. Um, they would be much less expensive and faster. Would be more, I'd be like more like, oh, okay, maybe you do know how to sell. Or you did a Dale Carnegie course or something to that effect. It would you know, kind of invest in yourself in that regard rather than say, you know, I got this big degree to think about strategy and management and operations and all these things. And you're like, I just need you to freaking sell our product. Like, that's what we need you to do. Like, it'd be better to say, like, hey, like, I went to some course on listening or improv or this or multi body reading body language. Like, I went to a seminar on reading body language. I'd be like, holy shit, that's interesting. Reading body language. Wonder how you could use that in a sales call or a pitch. Hey, Michael. Um, you know, you think in that regard, it's like, oh, okay, like, this makes someone interesting. And again, you want to think holistically about why you're more qualified than you think. Because you may be qualified because of who you are in your faith or your building or, you know, in your sports league or something you do with acting or drama. Hey, Oliver. Um, and so there's just a lot of different things that you want to just, you know, kind of shed the inferior kind of, I need more time or experience or education to go for something. Now, you also want to balance that and not have too much of kind of that millennial kind of bravado where it's like, I want to run the company. And, you know, like all you've done is like, you know, checked out clothes at Zara or something like that's maybe not the case. You want to like balance that and say like, Hey, like one day I would love to run this company and I would like to work my way up and I would love to have an opportunity to start learning right now and whatever I'll do. You know, there are plenty of people that worked at companies, started in mail rooms or on trucks or whatever, that became CEOs. And it's a great way to kind of like rise through the ranks and learn the business. When I was at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, every single person, you know, our general manager of Colorado, which is like not a big market for them necessarily, you know, has made a healthy seven-figure income. And she, you know, rose through the ranks like everyone else that started as a management training intern, like at those, you know, computer terminals and vacuuming cars and driving around, driving people to their houses and picking them up. Like, that's how she started. She knew the business. And so then she grew, and so was her qualification that she went to Princeton? No. Her qualification is she learned on the job. I mean, most adult brain development does not happen in a classroom, and it doesn't happen with books. That's about 10%. 70%, according to Princeton, is on the job, informal, and social, like learning by doing. You know, I learn how to do marketing campaigns by doing marketing campaigns. I learn how to launch technology products by doing technology. Like, most things I've, like, learned, I've learned by doing around other smart people. That's why having mentors and having colleagues that are smart and kind of stunning that impress you and inspire you is key. But, you know, you're going to learn those things by doing. So you just need to use your network. You know, applying online is a real crapshoot because recruiters get, I think, on average, like 130 applicants for every job online for white collar job in America. And so they're just trying to cull down to 10 people the phone screen so they can put three people in front of the manager. So if they get 130 applicants, they got to get rid of 120. And they quickly go, oh, this person, this, doesn't have this or that. And they just look, they, what they're doing is they're looking for weaknesses or flaws. And a lot, that's a big failure in corporate hiring is people hire for lack of weaknesses rather than strengths. And so the thing is, is that you want to get into a conversation with someone that can get you an interview. So networking and someone that you know that you might know in your professional network. They're not going to get you a job, but they're going to get you the sit down where you can make your case about why you're going to learn it or why you're going to work on it or whatever. And frankly, there'll be things in job descriptions that'll say like, "Oh, we really want someone to be like really good at like data analysis." And then you like sit down the interview and you're like, "Actually, we've got Julie over here who's like smokes data analysis. What we really need is someone who's really good with like press and someone that we can like put in front of the camera or someone that can like go out on a stage or represent us in public and like be at the job description because it's the same role that Julie has may have been biased towards what she was good at. And that's actually not what they want. So, you know, when I was in management consulting, I could financial model, which was a part of the job, but I was never great at it. I was just good at it. I just, I mean, it wasn't bad and I wasn't great and I was never going to be great. It wasn't my strength. 
And I understood it. Now, I understood the bigger strategic implications. I understood the logic behind all of it and the problems we were solving. But what was, I was great at implementation. I was great at influencing people, training, speaking, all this stuff. So I'd be out there and I would take like in you know Indianapolis, I'd be in a big aircraft hangar training 35 mechanics and overalls covered in hydraulic fluid, you know, about like, you know, what how to actually do something, how to how to you know work more efficiently, or I'd get them convinced that we were gonna make things better and I'd get them to buy in, or I'd say, like, why does it take so long to paint this freaking helicopter? And they'd say, Well, we don't have good lights, and then I'd figure out how to get the lights fixed. And then all of a sudden we'd paint it you know, it was like those things that weren't in a financial model, but they were also useful. So what happened was like I had a colleague who was really good at the modeling and then I was really good at this other facilitation and, and influence and leadership stuff and we combined that together, it was like a one-two punch. Just the modeling wasn't enough and just what I brought wasn't enough, but it was together. So it's kind of the you know, stronger together thought. So again, you know, companies are desperate for talent. Every business owner I know, and I know mostly US business owners, but like desperate for people. Can't get good people, half the people on their team they don't like or they're not that good, they're like B players or C players. Um, and they just can't, you know, most people, if I say like, Hey, do you, or are you flush with talent? You have an attorney, you know, not the case. Now certain sexy brands or sexy startups, sure. But even still, if you look at, you know, a lot of companies, like you think of Google, which used to be small and is now massive 40,000 sort of person company, there's a lot of average mediocre people working at Google, despite their best kind of very progressive HR efforts. And they're always interested in getting better people. You know, they think that, you know, they talk about, you know, false positives, hiring someone that they thought was going to be good. That's not but also false negatives. They had this whole project Janus to figure out who are the people we should have brought in that based on paper they might not have been good, but in reality they would have like killed it here. So they are realizing that even their model, which is very evolved and very progressive and very sophisticated and data driven, like has some holes in it. So you're more qualified than you think. 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 Like that's what I want you to remember again and again. When you see an opportunity, you know, when I got to join a board of directors to help repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I wasn't in the military and I'm not a lawyer and I, I'm not a lobbyist. Those are kind of the, the three things that were the most important to that organization. But I knew how to lead, I knew how to manage, I knew marketing, I knew all, you know, I knew money. And so I made a difference, but it was a part of a team. But I didn't let the fact that I'd never been on a nonprofit board before or didn't even have those sort of experiences get in the way because, in fact, I brought things they didn't have at all and I evolved things and made them much better in that regard. Hey, Armando. Um, so that's something to think about. You know, and really, like, again, I want you to think about confidence, you know, because job descriptions or opportunities or, you know, people, people think really low of themselves. And I, it's just surprising. Either people are like, usually people that are like wildly confident, sometimes they're incredibly like kind of like underskilled. And it's like, how do they get so much confidence? Um, or they're like, what I find most of the time is people that are really good are like, oh, like, I would only be so lucky if they picked me. And like, that's like not the posture. I mean, can you imagine going on a date and that's like your play? Like, hey, you want to like have a second date? You want to go home? Whatever. And like your play is that like, oh, I'm desperate. Like, you know, or like, oh, I'm so lucky. You know, no, you got to just be like, hey, like, like, like up here, like you into this? Like, what's next? And having that kind of energy. And I think that like, you don't question yourself in that regard. And if they're not into it, it's fine. It doesn't mean you're like bad. It's just like not what they needed or what they wanted. And that's fine. Find someone that's going to be good. And companies are, should be the same way as you think about dating in that regard. That it's like, if it's not it, next. Because it doesn't matter. There's just, I mean, there would be companies that like, if I went in, like, that they'd be like, oh, no, th this guy, he's like a little too creative. He's a little too, la you know, outspoken. Or, you know, he's gay. We don't like that. Or we hate beards. Or who knows what it might be, you know. I mean, come on. How, do you, how can you hate this beard? But... You know, you think about that, like there's going to there's gonna be plenty of people that are going to not be into me for a whole variety of reasons. Or they may say, you know what, we really need someone who's like super, super data driven that the data tells them the answers. And I'm more kind of intuitive and experience driven. So like I wouldn't be a good fit there. Like I wouldn't, that's not what they need. And it's not like they have a problem with their business model. They just figure that out. Molly, hey, what's up? Thanks for the shout out. Um, so I just want to give everyone like the freedom and the confidence to just go for what they want um, and to not let some stupid job description or some perception of a brand or who didn't get a job there in your network or who did get a job there in your network. Look, your friend that went to Harvard, they got a job wherever at Google, I'll use that example, doesn't mean you have to go to Harvard to get a job at Google. It just means your friend did. Like, great. 
you know, or your friend that went to Harvard that didn't get a job at Google doesn't mean that just because they don't hire a Harvard person doesn't mean they wouldn't hire you if you went to, you know, Middle Tennessee State or something like whatever. Like, you know, sometimes the, the you know, there's been studies that, you know, a lot of the top performing uh, folks don't come from the Ivy League, you know, um, that, they, that there's more hustle from people that come to, from second and third, thir- uh, thir- <laughs> third tier schools. Um, so, you know, so, so just like, you know, not letting that get in your way. Um, because again, most of the time, when people talk to me about career advice, they're scared and they're timid and they're confused and they're kind of, you know, like they're just you know, anxious. And I just want you to like let go of all that because get used to rejection. And that's a big part of it because you may get rejected and like that's okay. If you're not getting rejected, you're not trying enough. You know, you want to have no's because it's like someone that's like, like, oh, we have a, you know, 100% attrition. I'm like, well, you probably don't have good enough people because they're not getting offers. Or, or we have a 100% win rate on sales. You're probably not going in for big enough deals. Well, if you have a 100% rate on things, you're probably not striving enough. You're probably playing it very safe. So like getting, you know, like no is a part of things. There's jobs I wanted. I wanted a job at Southwest Airlines in college so badly I could taste it. They flew me down. And I was so excited, and I was a finalist for this thing, and they were doing this dual jet bridge boarding thing. We'd board from the front and the back of the plane. They were testing it, and I was like, blah, 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 like nuts about this idea, right? And I was obsessed with aviation. I was going to live in Dallas for the summer, which was like super sexy for me, and I'm 20 years old. They flew me down. I was ecstatic about this. And then they hired a guy with an operational engineering degree, a master's degree, um, who had done other passenger Q flow studies for his thesis, and compared to me, 20 years old with a marketing degree, or not uh, half of a marketing degree, he was a better choice. But I didn't let that get me down. Um, it was just like, okay, I went for the Southwest thing. Now, I also interviewed, I interviewed at, at Frontier Airlines, my, my hometown airline in Denver where I used to live. And I um, was very close to an offer there. And I realized that, hey, like the culture and the business model wasn't probably going to work for me. And, you know, I ended up going to consulting instead. And, you know, what I found is that, you know, Frontier ended up going bankrupt two years later, so I'm glad I wasn't there. And I learned more in a consulting environment about airlines and operations than I would have at the airline. It kind of, like, all worked out for, for a good reason. Oliver, thanks for the comment as well. Um, and so, you know, so it's, it's in Benjamin Yes is in Denver, so he's a big Denver fan. Um, and so, as am I. And so I just, you know, the thing is, is that, like, you know, you don't want to be this person. I spoke at a conference last week to about 200 people, and people, bankers and lawyers and insurance people, consultants. And people, what they found is, like, what I found is that people were very, like, good at, hey, Justin, hey, Tony. Um, people were really good at what they were good at, but they weren't always good at things that they enjoyed doing. Someone in this, this woman stopped me in the elevator. She goes, damn, I realize for eight years now, I've been getting really good at things I don't like doing. And that's like not where you want to be. So she had a big insight and an awareness out of the session that we had that maybe there's something else for her to do in her career, which is exciting to kind of figure that out before she's 50. Because what happens is if you're just continuing to only play to the things that you know um, and you don't enjoy them in particular, you're just going to become more and more specialized and more and more highly paid. And then you get really stuck. And then all of a sudden you're like, you know, 46 years old and you have a, you know, crisis about your career and you resent work and you just try to work as little as possible for that paycheck and you get away for the weekend. And like all of your pleasure in life happens outside of the office. And I just don't think that that's like a great way to live. And that's why I think that you want to really think about, you know, what you're both really good at and love doing. Like when I go to a coaching session, I'm more energized after the session. I I get fired up. I get fired up doing Facebook Live. Before I started the Facebook Live thing today, I was like, oh God, I threw this thing. And now I'm like, I'm like stoked. I'm like, I am qualified. You're qualified. Benjamin's qualified. Everyone's qualified. Like this is a unique blend for me of what I'm good at and I'm energized and enjoy doing. And so I've kind of found a sweet spot. And by the way, it's the thing I found actually make the most money doing, have the most impact, it's the most fun. It's that sort of an alignment. But if I, you know, said to be a coach, Like, you know, oh, well, I have to go get a two-year coaching certificate for $150,000, like someone had pitched to me. Um, And I was like, well, is that true? Like, I know how to give advice. I've had an executive coach for four years. Um, I worked in HR for four years. Like, I have a, you know, part of my degree was in leadership studies. And I always am working on myself. And I go to all these seminars and retreats. And I see a psychologist and and I meditate and all these things. Like, do I need all that to be a coach? And... What I realized is no, like I don't need to to do the the certification, I don't need to do the training around that. Um, Then I would be, you know, someone that I put people through a 12-step process and I have my little binder and and like that's fine for certain coaches, that ain't me. 
my coaching is very specific, very custom, very bespoke, intense. Like my clients, I tell you, I'll just like some days I'll just like touch that nerve and they're like, mm. and that's like part of the draw of working with me though, is I will say and ask and do the things that other people won't do that their staff won't tell them, their investors won't tell them. And I'll say, Hey, like this is getting in the way or you're screwing up or whatever it may be. And that's something that came from somewhere else inside of me, not from a training program. So the funny thing is in, because I, I, you know, I think people hire me on credibility and chemistry. I've had one person ever in my three plus years of having a coaching business, ask me where I went to school or what my degree was, or if I had an MBA, I think one person asked about MBA and one person asked just where I went to school in general. That's it. And I think one prospective client asked if I had a coaching certification. That's it. And I mean, I've talked to, I mean, I have a whole variety of clients and I've talked to a lot of different, I probably had a hundred sales calls in the three some years. No, no one cares about those things. They were much more like, who are your clients? How do you work? What am I going to get out of it? Those sort of things. And I could have felt inferior in all of my things. Hey, Rachel, I could have felt inferior and thought, gosh, I don't have a certificate from, you know, Jack's coaching shop or whatever the hell that, you know, and, and look, those are all fine if you want to do that. But instead I was like, Hey, I was a senior executive in business. Like I was born a business person. I was invoicing my sister for her toys when I was seven. Like that's my, in my blood, you know? And so like I went and like, like that's how I'm qualified. I'm qualified because I like my favorite section in the fricking business uh, is the business section. The New York Times is like always go to business first. I love reading about real leadership. I love about marketing, design, innovation, creativity. Like that's why I'm qualified. I'm, I'm interested and I'm curious and I connect the dots and I'm, I grow and I learn and I invest in myself. Like I'm qualified because of that, not because of some freaking certificate that I can hang on my wall and say, wah, wah. Like, that's great if you're trying to impress your mom or whatever, but your mom will probably be more impressed by your book of clients and the difference you're making in the world than a certificate. So that's what you think about when you're more qualified than you think. It's just not getting stopped by that. And don't assume that people are going to have a problem with it. Like, rather than have your dukes up and just be ready for someone to, to say, oh, gosh, you know, like, you know, I, I, am I qualified? Are they going to ask me about that? Think about a very clear line and then you want to pivot. It's like when someone's on TV and, you know, they get asked a question and that's like not the point of them being on the show. They say they answer it directly and succinctly and then they get right back onto the point. So people, you know, I had someone I talked to a couple weeks ago that was like all about like, am I, is Ben good enough and am I going to do the work? And I said, hey, like, you know, if that's where you're at questioning that, it's fine to question that. But I said, I'd much rather focus, like I said, I'm good and I know that. If you're not clear on that, maybe you shouldn't hire me. I want to focus on your results and what you want for your company. Because if we run some experiment to see if I'm a good enough coach, I'm not sure if that's going to move your company forward and if that's worth your time or your money. Boom, right? That's how I talked about it. It wasn't like my, my it wasn't, you know, oh, well, I've got all these things and I do all these things. I was like, look, I have like a, a, a book of business. It's very impressive. I work with some of the most powerful people uh, in business doing some of the coolest things and I make a difference and they're satisfied. I'm in a referral based business. Let's talk about what you're trying to achieve here, which I don't think is a test of me as a coach. I think you're talking about your business. You've got enough problems to solve. You're not solving the problem of like, is Ben good enough? So you just get around those sort of things. You know, it's like, you know, and I think that, you know, the other thing in like an interview, you're talking to someone, you know, ask them like, who took a bet on them? You may not have everything. You, and like, rather than try to say, oh yes, I've, I've done, you know, advanced international, this and that. And like, you haven't like, don't fib, don't lie. I remember I was on an airplane once and I was 21 going to Kalamazoo, Michigan for an interview. And a guy asked me a question if I'd done some work on something and I'd like studied it and read about it, but I never worked in it. And I didn't really make that super clear. And he very quickly, I kind of cracked my knuckles and he's like, Hey, like, don't ever say that in an interview because it's really obvious that you're trying to look smart, but you're not being honest fully about like the experience you have. And from that day forward, it was like such a transformative learning moment for me to just be like, here's what I got and here's what I don't got. And it actually gives people more confidence that you're honest and you're clear and you're truthful and that you're just very like straightforward about it, you know, and that they can, and that you might say, Hey, you know what? I've actually never done an international rollout, but I can tell you it's on my list of things I want to get good at. When I think about an international rollout and the things we would have to manage, it's cultural sensitivity, it's language and measurement complexity, it's time zone things. Here's the variety of things. And I think the best thing would be to like send me over wherever to like do that for a while. Like, have some thoughts rather than just be like, oh, like, I don't know, like what, you know, say like, oh no, like, you know, I've given this some thought or I read about this or like my mentor rolled out things all over Brazil for five years and my mentor has been teaching me about what it takes and I'm really curious to be good at that. So I can absolutely say like, I'm actually an international specialist in rollouts, that sort of thing where it's just like, you, and then someone says, okay, well like they're, they're going to figure it out. And, you know, again, having the confidence to learn. I mean, so much, if you look at what's like working in a startup is like, that's like learning. All you're doing is learning. 
all the time. And so it's like, you know, my, my team, great people, and I'm building off their strengths, but most of the stuff that they're working on most days is stuff that they've never worked on before or never worked on it in the way that we're working on it. So I hire more for someone that's willing to learn and to be open and try things and get feedback and be flexible. That's more important than saying, oh, did you work for an exact like startup doing this exact like thing? Because guess what? Two years ago, half the technology we're using didn't freaking exist. So the chance that someone's done this before in this way is very, very low. Yeah. Hey, Dustin. Uh, Benjamin on my team just mentioned being scrappy. That's a great, that's a great uh, point. You know, that's, you know, like, like, you know, are you qualified? Well, maybe you're qualified because you're scrappy, because you can hustle, because you can get shit done, you know? Someone that works at, has worked at a restaurant and can, you know, ha there's like a surge because, you know, this near a cruise ship and freaking 2,000 people come in for an hour and a half. Like, explaining that is interesting rather than be like, oh, I worked at a restaurant. I'm like this basic person in an apron. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, 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 let's talk about, like, what you had to do to get customers through in a short period of time and coordinate people when you're the maitre d' and there's crazy people and people are yelling at you and there's not enough of this or that, whatever. Like, that's interesting to me. That's going to be interesting to other employers. It makes you more, you may say, like, you could just say, oh, it's just a waitress. Or you could say, hey, like, here's what I had to figure out when 1,500 people come to my restaurant in an hour and a half period off of a cruise ship. Can I tell you a story? And they're like, sure. Like, what's that about? So that's qualification. You know, like I said earlier, you know, maybe that you organize, you may have a, a summer share out on the beach or in the mountains or something like that, and you have a house, and you're like the house mom or dad, and you've got the rules and the calendar and who's going out and how you're managing the money. That's a skill, right? Like keeping the peace, managing teams, all that. Like, you know, just like, you know, you might plan a trip. You know, you may be that like you planned this huge surprise for your dad's retirement and everyone flew into Paris or something like, like that's a story. It's like, how do you do that? How do you like have some big unveil? It's almost like a marketing campaign. And like those things make you qualified, you know, um, like aviation. When I went to Southwest Airlines, you know, what? they interviewed me because I was passionate about it. And, you know, airliners.net, this like, like geeky aviation blog that I still read to this day. Um, and I would read books and there was books on Southwest Airlines and magazines that, you know, it was like had pinups of, 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 you know, like triple sevens, you know, and like, that's what made me qualified is because I was just interested. I didn't go to Embry-Riddle. I didn't have a degree in aeronautical engineering. You know, I got to take one transportation systems class in my marketing degree. Um, that was, but I was qualified because I was passionate because I was interested. Um, so like, that's often enough. Um, you know, someone will like, you know, look at someone and, you know, it could even be for, you know, a receptionist. It can be someone or an assistant or it could be a finance person and they want to work in fashion and they can go work. They can hire some other finance person that came from an accounting firm or consulting, seem like really qualified on paper, or they could hire you that maybe you have a degree in it or you worked at a smaller company or whatever, but you may be like, I am obsessed with fashion and I follow the, I read Women's Wear Daily every day and I do this and like, you may like have that, like you're going to be more interesting candidate to them because you care about the work itself. You care about what's getting produced and that's going to have you do better work overall. So these are the insights that we're sharing on pilot minute coaching. Every week, one minute, it's free. You get some insight coaching from me. You make a plan for yourself, and then we follow up with you later. And then we custom advice from me, all for free. We're testing this out. So you want to get on this now because this is a test phase. We're, it's a beta we're testing out. And then we follow up with the Facebook Live thing the next week on the topic. And this one being, you're more qualified than you think. And again, I just want like like tattoo that in your freaking brain. You are more qualified than you think. Almost every job I had like was was you know a job that I had to convince someone to say, Take a chance on me. And guess what? It was, I was a chance worth taking. I made my, all my bosses look very good. It wasn't that I was perfect, but man, I learned and I made them successful and I tried and I innovated and I brought a lot to the table. You know, I got hired at Lockheed Martin out of college, a defense contractor to work on a classified spy plane development program in contract management. I knew like not that much about all that, but you know, through a connection from my professor, met someone else, had an interview and said, hey, I'm, I love aviation. You know, I'm, you know, big fan of, you know, just engineering in general. Like I want to, I like, I like process, all these things. And I went and I was a star and I did great there. And I met a lot of wonderful people. And it was like, literally you be, might be surprised to think a defense contractor for someone like me would be a great place to start a career. But I am incredibly grateful for the three plus years that I worked there in Denver because I learned really how to, I mean, when you work for a company that launches like, you know, spaceships and things to Mars and the next space shuttle and, processes social security and f-35s and you know you name it like 
shit's serious. Like, they got it together. Like, they know how to make things happen. And so I learned at a level of rigor that, you know, then I would go into other environments and I'd be like, here's how we plan and here's how we track. And, you know, and I learned to be a beast and just to plow through things that were really not sexy, but they were necessary to be buttoned up. And, you know, but I didn't let, you know, the fact that I didn't have a, you know, didn't serve in the military or didn't have a degree in engineering get in the way. Sometimes I felt a little inferior when I was there, but I had other skills. I managed the relationships. I worked with our suppliers. I would go to visit suppliers all over the country, traveling all the time, making sure that they understood what we needed and how to work. And I expedited things and I got them paid and I changed their contracts and we changed the technical requirements and all things that I learned to do over time. So check out Pilot Minute Coaching. Thanks for joining everybody. www.pilot.coach slash minute. We'll be back with more good stuff next week. And just remember, you're more qualified than you think. Cheers.